is uh, with regards to Rajya Sabha. Uh, the one third of the Rajya Sabha members keep retiring every two years. So the one third, which is around 72 MPs, currently they are retiring for the current Rajya Sabha term. So we'll discuss regarding Rajya Sabha's functions, eligibility for the members, disqualifications, and uh, division of seats. Okay. Then we'll also discuss one more uh, recent scheme introduced by the Ministry of MSME, which is raising and accelerating MSME performance ramp scheme. Also, we'll discuss about the hazardous waste management rules under which the government of India had uh, uh, had made ineligible the import of hazardous products, including plastic uh, bottles. However, these plastic bottles are being allowed currently because of protests from industries who are in the recycling business. Also, we'll discuss about the New India Literacy Program, which is aimed at uh, education for adults. Okay. The goal is to try and educate as many adults as possible. For that, uh, the Ministry of Education has launched a New India Literacy Program. And then we'll discuss about the Space Junk and also the Delhi Municipal Corporation Bill. Uh, which is a bill in order to unify all the three different uh, municipalities within Delhi itself. We'll also discuss about the other urban local uh, bodies such as uh, municipal corporations, municipalities. We'll discuss about town area committees, notified area committees and all of that. Okay. Moving on, the first topic that we'll do for today is the uh, farewell of the 72 Rajya Sabha MPs including seven nominated members are retiring from March to July, which is one third of the strength of the house. The Rajya Sabha is nothing but a continuing chamber, unlike the Lok Sabha, which is elected once every five years. Unlike the Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha never gets dissolved. Okay, rather it is a continuing chamber. It is a permanent body and not subjected to dissolution. However, one third of its members retire every second year. In Rajya Sabha, there are six year terms, while in Lok Sabha, there are only five year terms. Okay. Now, their seats are filled up by fresh elections and presidential nominations at the beginning of every third year. Okay. The retiring members are eligible for re election and renomination any number of times. The constitution has not fixed the term of office of the members of the Rajya Sabha and left it to the parliament. Accordingly, the parliament in the representation of People's Act 1951 provided that the term of the member of Rajya Sabha shall be six years. So this term of six years has not been given in the constitution. Rather, it has been given in the representation of People's Act of 1951. Okay. Now, uh, it has been given that the term is uh, six years and every uh, you know second year after every two years one third of the members will be removed off and the new uh, one third will be added okay the maximum strength of the Rajya Sabha is fixed at 250 out of which 238 are to be representatives of states this is given in the fourth schedule okay and union territories and 12 are nominated by the president now these nominations they can be people from arts, they can be people from public service or they can be people from uh, any eminent profession like literature, science and research and all of that. Okay. Presently, the Rajya Sabha has 245 members. Of these 229 members are represented by the states and 4 members represent the union territories and 12 members are nominated like what we discussed. Okay. Now, the position of the Rajya Sabha. Uh, okay, before the position of the Rajya Sabha, we'll discuss about eligibility to be a member of the Rajya Sabha. Eligibility. Okay, now in order to be eligible for the Rajya Sabha, the constitution, it says the article 84 of the constitution. Article 84 of the constitution, it gives certain uh, qualifications. He must be a citizen of India. Okay. Uh, and he should also subscribe before some person authorized in that behalf by the election commission and oath or affirmation according to the form set out for the purpose in the third schedule to the constitution. 
So I am sure you know all the schedules of the constitution. The first schedule of the constitution talks about the various states. Second schedule of the constitution talks about the salaries for different people. Third schedule talks about the oaths. So Article eighty four says that he should be a person. Uh, he should be a citizen of India, and he should also affirm to an oath, which is given in the third schedule of the constitution. Also, he must not be less than thirty years of age. Okay. he must not be lesser than 30 years of age nor should be uh he should have you know i'm sorry he should not be less than 30 years of age i have no idea why the zero keeps going off uh uh he must also possess all the other qualifications as may be prescribed on that behalf by parliament so even he should have all the other qualifications what the parliament says he should have now apart from this what are the conditions for disqualification of the members of the rajya sabha disqualification okay now article 102 is the thing that uh, notes down all the issues which are there for disqualification of members of the rajya sabha if the person under 102 article if the person holds under article 102 if the person holds any office of profit okay any office of profit he or she shall not be eligible okay and under 102 clause 2 if he is of unsound mind and is so declared by a competent court then he can be disqualified okay sound mind other thing is if he is an undischarged insolvent then he can be disqualified then if he is not a citizen of india or has voluntarily acquired the citizenship of a foreign state then he can be disqualified you know if he is not a citizen of india as has been prescribed under the qualifications okay not a citizen not a citizen and apart from this if at all he is disqualified under any other law made by the parliament the fifth uh, criterion is any other law made by the parliament law okay so under this the a parliament has made some of the disqualification provisions under representation of peoples act uh, will not go into that right now that is given under section 8 of the representation of peoples act please go through it okay now uh, we are uh, now we shall discuss about the position of the rajya sabha now also apart from all of this please remember that disqualification can also be done under the 10th schedule for Uh, you know, jumping of or uh, shifting loyalties from one party to another party. Also, now we'll discuss about the position of the Rajya Sabha. Where is it equal to the Lok Sabha? Introduction and passing of ordinary bills and passing constitutional amendment bills and passing of financial bills involving the expenditure from the Consolidated Fund of India, election and impeachment of the president, election and removal of the vice president. However, over here Rajya Sabha has a special power. that only rajya sabha can initiate the removal of the vice president first of all it has to be removed he has to be removed through an effective majority effective majority means majority of the total number of members of that house not just those who are present and voting rather the total number of members who are a part of that house and it should be later agreed to by the lok sabha through a simple majority then making recommendation to the president for the removal of the chief justice and judges of the supreme court high courts chief election commissioner or the com- controller not the general so for any of these things rajya sabha has equal powers with that of the lok sabha approval of the ordinances issued by the president after uh, you know convening of the house approval of the proclamation of all three types of emergencies let it be national emergency let it be uh, president's rule or let it be financial emergency selection of ministers including the prime minister so please remember this is one of the differences that india has with uk in uk the minister should only come from the house of people but in india the ministers can come even from the council of elders 
that it can come they can come from even the rajya sabha okay consideration of the reports of constitutional bodies like the finance commission the union public service commission the comptroller not the general etc okay and also enlargement of the jurisdiction of supreme court and the union public service commissions where is it unequal with the lok sabha okay when it comes to all monetary issues when it is a money bill it can be only introduced in the lok sabha and not in the rajya sabha okay now uh rajya sabha cannot amend or reject a money bill at max it can only delay it by 14 days and then after that it has to be either sent back uh, it has to be approved and sent back or there can be recommendations now the lok sabha can either accept or deny any all of the recommendations and the bill is to have it is deemed to have been passed by both of them then a financial bill not containing solely the matters of article 110 also can be introduced only in the lok sabha and not in the rajya sabha please remember this over here also okay even if all of the matters are not just those which are in article 110 rather there is even one of those matters which is incidental or which is related to article 110 and most of the others are outside that that is if it is a financial bill of the first type finance bill sorry uh, finance bill of the first type finance bill of the first type then also uh, it can be only introduced in the uh, lok sabha and not in the rajya sabha but when it comes to their passage not just introduction when it comes to their passage even rajya sabha can pass it it has equal powers the final power to decide whether a bill is a money bill or not lies with the speaker and also when they have a joint sitting in case of non agreement uh, over any particular bill between the lok sabha and the rajya sabha and they have a joint sitting of both the houses in that condition also it is the speaker of the lok sabha who sits over the joint presiding uh, proceedings and also it is the rules of procedure of the lok sabha which is followed and also also a lok sabha since it has bigger numbers it has around 500 and uh, you know 40 people and uh, rajya sabha like what we just saw it has only about 238 people so the lok sabha which has the greater number of people it always wins or it usually wins uh, when it comes to a joint sitting also rajya sabha can only discuss the budget but cannot vote on the demand for grants which is a prerogative of the lok sabha also when it comes to discontinuation of the national emergency the rajya sabha cannot pass a resolution for the discontinuation of the national emergency rather it can be only passed by the lok sabha also rajya sabha cannot remove the council of ministers by passing a no confidence motion this is because the council of ministers is responsible only to the lok sabha okay now but rajya sabha can discuss and criticize the policies and activities of the government now there are certain provisions which only the rajya sabha can do and not the lok sabha such as when the parliament has to make a law on some of the subjects of the state list it can authorize the parliament why because rajya sabha is nothing but a representation of the states under article 140 249 it can do this it can also authorize the parliament for this it you need around 2/3 of the majority in rajya sabha also it can authorize the parliament to create an all india service common to both the center and the states okay it can alone initiate the removal of the vice president like what we had discussed earlier and also if a proclamation is issued by the president for imposing national emergency or president's rule in a financial emergency at a time when the lok sabha has been dissolved then this dissolution uh, during this dissolution period only when the rajya sabha approves the proclamation only then is it valid okay because like we said rajya sabha is a continuing chamber as a continuing chamber so rajya sabha has to approve this proclamation of emergency otherwise the proclamation will lapse and it has to approve it through two thirds of the majority in the case of national emergency while in the case of uh, while in the case of president rule okay it has to be a simple majority which is just half or more
pardon me for the writing today there seems to be something uh, with the pen as such i'll try and fix it now raising and accelerating msme performance scheme this is a new scheme which has been launched by the ministry of msme union cabinet has approved a 800 million dollar scheme and it is assisted by the world bank it is a it, it is a new scheme and it will start only from 2020 to 23 it is a central sector scheme remember this it is a central sector scheme which means that all the funding is given by the center itself and not the states it has been launched to support various resilience and recovery interventions of the msme ministry in addition to building the msme ministry's capacity at the national level the ramp scheme also will scale up the implementation capacity of msmes in the states okay the program it will aim at improving access to market and credit for msmes strengthening institutions and uh, governance at the center and the states improving center state linkages and partnerships addressing the issues of delayed payments for msmes and also the most important issue of greening of msmes which is nothing but trying and trying to ensure that msmes are polluting as little as possible okay now msmes have huge importance when it comes to india why because they make up about 45% of the total export potential uh, and they are responsible for about 40% of the total manufacturing output of the country okay 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 and uh, also apart from this they also employ huge number of people and they are also employing people who belong to the lower rungs of the society and hence their importance becomes multifold okay now what are the other functions of this ramp scheme it acts as a policy provider it acts as a knowledge provider and it also acts as a technology provider it acts as a policy provider through enhanced capacity for evidence based policy making okay and it also acts as a knowledge provider by sharing and demonstrating the best practices for msmes it also acts as a technology provider by providing access to high end technology such as artificial intelligence data analytics internet of things machine learning to msmes okay now what is the significance of msmes there are around 63.4 million units in india of msmes and they contribute to about 6% of the manufacturing gdp and about 24% of the gdp from services they also uh, contribute to around 33.4% of india's manufacturing output and they contribute around 45% of the overall exports from india okay and about 20% of the msmes are based out of rural areas which indicates the deployment of significant rural workforce in the msme sector okay now moving on next topic import of plastic bottles for waste processing has been allowed okay uh, you can uh, see that india had banned the import of plastic waste in 2019 under the hazardous waste management rules under the hazardous waste management rules and uh, we had banned the import of plastics however the environment ministry has permitted containers made up of polyethylene terephthalate as a plastic waste to be imported for processing only this particular material of bottles can be imported for processing the decision to roll back the ban was taken last year after representations by several industries who said that there was too little waste in india for you know uh, recycling An expert committee of the Environment Ministry last December recommended that firms which had applied for permission could import polyethylene terephthalate flakes and bottles up to 50% of their production capacity. And hence, on the basis of these recommendations of this ex- expert committee, India, I mean, uh, the Union Environment Ministry has permitted containers made up of polyethylene terephthalate to be imported for processing. Now. What is this polyethylene terephthalate? It is a category of plastic, and nearly 90% of the domestic supply of containers using them has already is already recycled. Okay, so around 90% of the domestic uh, supply containers which use polyethylene terephthalate is recycled, and this explains the reason why 
you know uh, several companies want to lift the ban on import of these plastic containers so that they can do recycling now earlier why was it banned it was banned because of this organization pandit din dayal upadhyay smriti manch who had played an important role in center's decision to impose a ban on plastic waste according to them there is no shortage of polyethylene terephthalate in india as per industry data more than 14 lakh tons of such plastic are consumed annually in india and even with the global highest 80% recycling rate approximately 2.8 lakh tons of plastic bottles waste never gets collected this is the data that is being given by this uh, pressure group or by this organization and they're saying that you know only 80% uh, we have recycling the rest are 2.8 lakh tons of plastic bottles are not even getting collected more on plastic management recently if you remember we had discussed about the plastic waste management rules of 2021 uh, the union ministry of environment forest and climate change issued a notification prohibiting the manufacture import stocking distribution sale and use of single use plastics from july 1 2022 uh under the plastic waste management amendment rules of 2021 now these rules are done or they are framed under the environment protection act of 1986 now what are these uh, plastic waste management rules they prohibit manufacture import stocking distribution sale and use of single use plastics including polystyrene and expanded polystyrene from 1st of july 2022 now what do these uh, products contain what are these single use plastics earbuds with plastic sticks plastic sticks for balloons plastic flags candy sticks ice cream sticks polystyrene for decoration plates cups glasses cutlery wrapping or packaging films around sweet boxes invitation cards cigarette packets plastic or pvc banners less than 100 microns stirrers all of them are single use plastics and it uh the rules prohibit the manufacture import stocking storage or distribution and sale okay now the ban will not apply to commodities made up of compostable plastics please remember this and the permitted thickness of the plastic bags will will be increased to 75 microns from 30th september 2021 and to 120 microns from 31st december 2022 okay so whatever is the permitted thickness of the plastic bags currently it will be increased to around 75 microns from september 2021 and it will be increased to 120 microns from 31st of december 2022 also it is the central pollution control board which will monitor the act and the rules new india literacy program okay like what we had discussed uh, this new india literacy program is therefore adult education it is there in order to provide education program to the adults and it is based and uh, okay one more important thing is that it shall not be called adult education anymore rather it shall be called as education for all okay now why is it not called adult education because education for all covers even children who are aged between 15 and above and adult education does not cover all the people it does not uh, cover you know people who are aged 15 years and above rather it covers only adults aged people so as a more inclusive term they are using education for all rather than adult education it is based on online modules and it is based on volunteerism please remember this about the scheme okay the cabinet has approved a centrally sponsored scheme it is not a central sector scheme rather it is a centrally sponsored scheme new india literacy program it has been approved for the next financial uh, five financial years in order to improve uh, adult education or in this case education for all program which is in line with the national education policy now what is the policy what are the features of this policy it aims to support the states and union territories in promoting literacy amongst non literates in the age group of 15 and above it will cover all across the country covering 5 crore non literates during the implementation period for this 5 years it will cover around 5 crore people okay 
the scheme has five components namely foundational literacy and numeracy which means basic skills such as reading and basic number skills numer skill numeracy skills critical life skills it will cover vocational skills development basic education and it will also support continuing education there is involvement of school students pre service students of higher education institutions school teachers anganwadis and asha workers all these people will be involved in the scheme they shall be involved in a volunteeristic base on the volunteeristic basis they can be school students who will teach them they can be pre service students of higher education uh, institutions school teachers okay now where will the scheme be implemented it will be implemented at the school at the level of schools it will be implemented and there will be usage of internet and communication technology and uh, online other online methods such as online teaching learning and assessment system it's called atlas atlas rather atlas i'm sorry okay uh so the scheme is uh, being rolled out through information and communication technology and through digital means such as atlas system online teaching learning and assessment system okay and uh, resources through digital modes such as tv radio cell phone based and open uh, open source based apps and all of that so there is a heavy reliance on digital uh, education in this particular scheme and like what i said schools will be the unit of implementation from the schools only this scheme is being implemented like at the school level all these school students or uh, school teachers uh, anganwadi student uh, anganwadi uh, workers all of them they help out uh, in the implementation of the scheme and usually ict and atlas systems will be used for teaching the scheme will be implemented through volunteerism through the online mode like what i said it will be on the basis of volunteer approach in the online mode next space junk why is it in the news with space junk posing increasing threat to indian assets in space the isro is building its orbital debris tracking capability by deploying new radars and optical telescopes under the netra project okay so what is this uh, problem of space junk you know space junk is nothing but debris uh, which consists of spent rocket stages dead satellites fragments of uh, space objects and debris resulting from asat what is asat asat is nothing but anti satellite anti satellite as in uh, india had tested its anti satellite weapon which was used to take out one of the satellites of india itself okay so whenever missiles are used against satellites it creates a lot of fragments and chunk and the space debris it hurtles at it moves around at an average speed of around 20000 27000 km per hour in the lower earth orbit and these objects pose a very real threat as collisions involving even centimeter size fragments can be lethal to satellites for protecting its assets isro was forced to perform 19 collision avoidance maneuvers in 2021 of which 14 were in lower orbit imagine this in just one year india had to perform around 19 collision avoidance maneuvers so this netra mission for tracking orbital debris can help us reduce the number of collision avoidance maneuvers and it can also safeguard indian satellites in the space okay this collision avoidance maneuvers has jumped from just 3 in 2015 to around 12 in 2020 and to, and 19 in 2021 so it's increasing at a massive uh, speed isro's efforts to control this uh, space debris is coordinated by the ssa control center in bangalore what is ssa it is nothing but space situational awareness through which you know uh, isro is aware of all the debris which is around in space and how it has to protect itself and it is managed by the directorate of space situational awareness and management at the isro headquarters in bangalore now what is this netra project netra project is nothing but uh netra project is nothing but it is a space debris tracking radar 
with a range of around 1500 kilometers and an optical telescope which will be inducted as a part of establishing an effective surveillance and tracking network okay so under netra you have both a radar as well as you have a telescope which will provide effective surveillance the government has given the go ahead for the deployment of the radar which will be capable of detecting and tracking objects just 10 cm and above in size okay because even a few small centimeters of space junk can disrupt and destroy satellites okay it will be de designed indigenously and completely built indigenously radars and optical telescopes are vital ground based facilities for keeping an eye on space objects including orbital junk now even this netra project i believe will be under the space situational awareness uh, center in bangalore itself Now, uh, also, please remember that this entire uh, space debris and uh, this entire concept of uh, space debris rotating around at 27,000 kilometers per hour and colliding into objects, this is known as Kessler syndrome. Okay, and uh, the Kessler syndrome says that if at all there is too much of space junk in orbit, it could result in a chain reaction, where more and more objects will collide and create new space junk in the process. to a point where the earth's orbit will become unusable it will be like a domino effect and this is the uh, i mean this is nothing but the kessler syndrome okay moving on delhi municipal corporation amendment bill this is a new bill in order to merge all the different municipalities within delhi delhi has about three municipal corporations and uh, this three municipal corporations will be merged into one municipal corporation uh, this bill was passed by the lok sabha recently okay so what are the provisions of this bill the bill replaces the three municipal corporations with one corporation named the municipal corporation of delhi and uh, it changes certain things such as the powers of the delhi government the previous act that was there it empowered the delhi government to decide various matters under the act these include total number of seats of councillors and number of seats reserved for members of the scheduled castes division of the area of corporations into zones and wards delimitation of wards matters such as salary and allowances leave of absence of the commissioner sanctioning of consolidation of loans by a corporation sanctioning suits for compensation against the commissioner for loss of waste or misapplication of a uh, municipal fund or property so all these powers were earlier under the delhi government but this new act it states that these powers shall be under the central government from now on and not under the delhi government also the new act talks about the removal of director of local bodies the previous act provided for a director of local bodies to assess the delhi government and discharge certain functions but the bill omits the provision for a director of local bodies the new bill the amended bill it says that we don't need to have a director of local bodies to assess the delhi government and hence we are removing this post itself also the new act talks about e governance system for citizens obligatory functions of the new corporation the delhi municipal corporation will be to include an e governance system for citizen services on any time anywhere basis for better accountable and transparent administration so the new bill is increasing e governance also the conditions of service for sweepers has been changed under the new bill the previous act provides that the sweeper employed for doing uh, scavenging of a building would be required to give a reasonable cost or a 14 day notice before discontinuing his service the bill seeks to omit this entire provision so now the sweepers don't need to give any particular notice before discontinuing their service they can do it then and there itself now we'll also discuss a little bit regarding various municipal corporations now uh, the different types of uh, urban local bodies are municipal corporations and then we have uh, municipalities and we have notified area committees and uh, we also have town area committees we have uh, portal authorities and uh, yeah, several others okay 
some of the urban local bodies the most important urban local body is the municipal corporation and lesser powers are with the municipalities and even lesser devolution of powers is there with the town area committee the notified area committee area committee i'm sorry the notified area committee and also the port authority cantonment board okay so these are the most important ones and across india a majority of the urban local bodies are of these types uh while these are found at a lesser i mean they are not as important because they don't have sufficient devolution of powers now uh we will discuss uh, some of these things okay okay under the constitution we have article 243q which talks about municipalities and article 243r 243q talks about municipalities 243r it talks about uh, the composition of municipalities and states that all of its members are directly elected by the people of the municipal area and uh, article 243s it talks about the uh, composition of the ward committees and uh, article 243t talks about reservation of seats in every municipality and article 243w talks about the powers and authorities of the various people who are governing these municipalities so municipalities and municipal corporations have actually been specified particularly in the constitution itself as to how they have to be governed and uh, how they have to be ruled whereas these other things these actually are based on the acts of parliament or they are based on the acts of the state government okay uh municipal corporations are established in states by acts of the state legislature and in uts by the acts of the parliament each corporation has three organs namely council standing members and commissioner council i'm sorry uh, council uh standing committees and the standing committees and the commissioner now the commissioner is the person who is executing most of the functions okay while the council and the standing committee okay they act as a legislature sort of okay the council is a legislative body and it is headed by the mayor okay and it also consists of councillors who are directly elected by the people while well, the commissioner is nothing but the chief executive authority he is the executive of these municipal corporations now what are municipalities when it comes to municipalities we have said that all these provisions of the uh, constitution they are applicable to uh, municipal corporations and municipalities okay now what are municipalities they are established by the acts of the concerned state legislature for administration of towns and some smaller cities and they have a municipal council a municipal uh, committee and also a chief executive officer the same ceo okay however over here this council is a little bit more powerful as compared to the council of a municipality uh, of a municipal corporation i'm sorry okay the council is headed by a president or a chairman person and in place of the commissioner they have a chief executive officer okay they have a chief executive officer and the council is headed by a president over here this president has actually better powers as compared to the mayor over here in municipal corporation okay then uh, you have the notified area committee a notified area committee is established for the administration of an area which is either fast developing town or it is developing due to industrialization okay it is established uh, through a notification in the gazette itself and it is an entirely nominated body 
okay there are no elections that happen whereas in the case of these two municipalities and municipal corporations you have elections because that is given under the constitution now after that in the town area committee this is established for small towns okay and it is also created by a state legislature act it can be a body fully appointed by the government of a state or a body that is fully elected or it can be partially elected it can be anything okay then you have a cantonment board cantonment board is usually established for the municipal administration for uh, the civil civilian population in cantonment areas it is for governance of cantonment areas okay it was set up under the provisions of the cantonments act of 2006 so under the cantonments act of 2006 various cantonment boards are set up okay uh, currently in india there are about 62 cantonment boards and uh, they are divided into various categories uh, you know category is based on the population of the cantonment boards itself the executive officer of the cantonment board is appointed by the president please remember this the president is the person who appoints the executive officer of the cantonment boards whereas over here the executive officers are appointed by the state government itself okay the state government whereas over here the executive officer is appointed by the president okay now that is it for the day uh-huh.